my name is Shabna Nassim and I'm the director of the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here for a very timely discussion on um, ending the war in Afghanistan. Um, when we actually arranged this, um, this kind of discussion, we didn't expect that it would fall at such an important stage. We've had the election results come out last week, Tuesday. There's a week-long reduction of violence um, and, and also the Afghan peace process deal is to be signed on the 29th. So this is an extremely well-timed conversation. Hopefully we'll have a lot of different insights um, contributing to this. You can engage with us um, and each other on Twitter with today's hashtag Afghanistan Peace Process. So please do share your insights and any sort of comments that you have on there. Um, as you may be aware, Conservative Friends of Afghanistan was founded last year. Um, as an organisation that aims to strengthen the relationship between the UK and Afghanistan and engaging the British Afghan diaspora into political and policy related discussions. We are pleased to have the support of our patrons, Nusrat Ghani MP, Sir Michael Fallon, Tom Tuggenhat, Baroness Nicholson, Baroness Singh Dawasi and uh, Imran Khan MP. This is our third event. Uh, since we launched, and today's discussion has been prompted by the, the, dia uh, the diaspora uh, living in the UK who have concerns over the peace talks and have approached us to hold a platform for this discussion. Um, we do intend to be involved in all levels of, of the process, uh, including convening discussions like these. Here in London, our meetings with key state stakeholders of the Conservative Party in the UK government and uh, the Foreign Office um, is on how to bring an end to an 18 year long war with an intention to publish great uh, detailed substantive topics related to peace. Um, hosting these sort of dialogues is key to bringing together women, uh, youth and elders and helping them provide uh, helping to provide them with the skills and tools necessary to participate in the peace process and have a say in the future of their country. These are just a few examples of how CFA is trying to implement its mission. A year and a half ago, the Trump administration took what could be called a bold but risky decision to begin direct and open discussions with the Taliban on how to end the insurgency and to allow US troops to return home. This was prompted by the recognition by all, all sides that there was no viable military solution to the war. The process, the people of Afghanistan continue to suffer, suffer ever greater civilian casualties. The need for peace is palpable. Whatever, whatever path lies ahead, we know that the way forward must provide lasting security and preserve the hard-won gains, gains earned by the people of Afghanistan. Since December 2018, the, U the US have been engaging with the Taliban negotiating team in Doha to agree on condi conditions for reduction of violence and the lasting political solution to the conflict. The, the team has made frequent visits to Kabul as well as to inform the government of Afghanistan on the progress made during these talks and to urge them to prepare themselves for negotiations with the Taliban for the final political settlement. The US have also been making a concerted diplomatic effort traveling through the region to secure cooperations and support from countries in the region and the international community. It now appears that, according to news reports, these efforts have achieved a preliminary agreement between the US and the Taliban to reduce violence and an agreement by the Taliban to begin negotiations with the uh, government of Afghanistan, which they previously refused to recognize. Naturally, such an agreement raises all sorts of questions. What are the implications of Afghanistan's, uh, of this, to Afghanistan's security? Can the Taliban ever be trusted to negotiate? What will remain of Afghanistan's constitution, especially its protection of women's rights? And based on the recent election of Ashraf Ghani, 
and the news we heard yesterday where the United States have asked Ashraf Hani to defer his second term inauguration over concerns that it will inflame the election feud with Dr. Abdullah Abdullah, what implications will this have on the US-led peacemaking efforts? And so when this uh, event was arranged, we envis envisaged a discussion on the latest developments from Doha, including understanding what was reached by the, uh, by the US and the Taliban on the, reduction, the week long production of violence, and the next steps in the political process. Last week, however, the Independent Election Commission of Afghanistan announced that Mr. Uh, Ashraf Hani has received 50% of the vote, with Dr. Abdullah Abdullah and others seeing the process was flawed and challenging the result. So I do expect that this discussion will encompass many associated risks and challenges associated with the peace process and what steps can be taken to bring an end to, the, uh, to the, the America's longest war. Our distinguished panel today will discuss these issues and several others. The, the discussion will be moderated by myself and I will be joined by Christina Lamb, who is one of Britain's leading foreign correspondents and a best-selling author. She has report reported from most of the world's hotspots, starting with Afghanistan, after an unexpected wedding invitation led her to Karachi in 1987, when she was 21. So she started traveling with the Mujahideen, fighting the Soviet Union, and within two years, she's been named the youngest journalist of the year. She went on to be named Foreign Correspondent of the Year five times, and she's been made an OVE by the Queen in 2013. As well as M Emily Winter Bogum. Emily is the Director of the Terrorism and Conflict Group and Research Fellow, Senior Research Fellow at RUSI, focusing on extremism and radicalization, countering violent extremism, and peace building. She has also regional expertise in South Asia, particularly Afghanistan. And she has over 10 years desk and field experience in international policy making uh, and is a deployed civilian expert to the UK government's stabilisation unit. We are also pleased to have Baron, uh, Right Honourable Baroness Saida Wasi, who is a lawyer, a businesswoman, a campaigner and a cabinet minister. Saida Wasi has had many roles, but the best is known, uh, she's known for is being the first Muslim to serve in the British cabinet. She has served as Senior Minister of State at the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth Office responsible for Afghanistan and has made many trips to Kabul, working directly with the government. Um, and last but not least, Tom Tuckenhat, who will, he is currently delayed because of a prior meeting, but he will join us very shortly. Um, he is the Member of Parliament for Tonebridge and Morley and the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee. He left the British Army in July 2013 uh, after a career in which he served <coughs> on, on operations in Afghanistan and helping set up the National Security Council um, and the government in Helmand Hel Hel province. Um, to start with, um, I would like to ask the panellists to provide their own input on the situation of Afghanistan and their personal experiences, um, and more specific, specifically, the nature of the conflict seems to have been quite transformative. The question I, I want to ask is, uh, our panellists, is, um, is how, having moved and transformed um, the relationship with the Taliban as um, an enemy on the battlefield, now to a partner in a peace process, can we really rely on them to bring peace to Afghanistan and end the war? So I will start with Emily. And yes, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I mean, as Shabnam says, I've, I've been kind of closely engaged with Afghanistan for a decade now. Um, I lived there full time from 2009 to 2015. So I look at Afghanistan and the peace process in particular, um, primarily from my first three years um, where I was a researcher for the Afghan Research um, Evaluation Unit, looking and exploring Afghan perceptions of justice, peace and reconciliation, and including uh, talking to them about the compromises that they would be willing to make in the interest of peace. But then I joined uh, the European Union as a, a special advisor to, to the EU Special Representative, focused on the peace process, 
And of course, a whole world of different challenges come out there. You know, as a researcher, you can say, well, why aren't you doing this and this should happen? Then as soon as you join government, you go, okay, there's a number of different obstacles which I hadn't uh, really considered. And so since then, I think the last kind of five years where I've been at RUSI, I've been able to take a step back and kind of say, well, where is Afghanistan now? And being, you know, in the UK domestic context, um, to explore the issues um, more broadly. So I'm going to try and bring in some of those insights. Um, I do think that the current state of play is probably the best chance we've seen in terms of a peace deal, and I'd say peace deal in kind of inverted commas. Um, I think we need a lot more to actually call it peace. Um, you know, every spring kind of fighting season, we always talk about, oh, it's imminent, something's going to happen this year, and every single year I think I've been saying, well, I'm not really sure that's going to happen this year, and maybe this time around I'm kind of proved wrong, and that's a good thing. Um, but I will talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I think um, are probably or could arise over the coming weeks and months. Um, I think looking actually at the US, the role is going to be very pivotal. Um, as Shevlin says in her introduction, you know, there was a big shift um, um, in terms of President Trump, in terms of his shift in terms of 2018, bringing this reconciliation withdrawal plan. You know, when he first come in in 2016, everyone had been going, well, are we actually going to get him involved? Is he even interested in Afghanistan? Throughout his campaign, he'd been sort of, I think there was no single mention of actually Afgan Afghanistan in any of his campaign speeches. And then he comes in with this sort of new strategy, which was very offensive, talking about um, killing terrorists, you know, no troop withdrawal timelines. Um, and again, when I used to did training to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, I'd say, you know, fight and talk won't work. And again, maybe I've been proved wrong. Um, but the four kind of key elements, I think, in relation to the current approach that they've had, which is the withdrawal of US troops, the requirement for the Taliban to settle links with terrorism, um, the ceasefire and the intra-Afghan talks. Um, in reality, it looks like quite a lot of those four components, I think, have been undermined already. Um, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, but it does seem to seem at the moment that we're in a sort of position of that previous formula, which was nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, is off the table. Um, and I think that leaves everyone in the room probably going, well, what does that really mean once we get to the intra-Afghan uh, negotiations um, in terms of the content of those peace talks? I think looking back at that kind of trajectory that Trump's taken, um, the key risk we're going to have is that any delay um, or if the reduction in violence that we're now calling the ceasefire, a reduction in violence, um, doesn't hold, uh, that Trump himself and, and the US side are going to show very little patience. I also think they're going to have very little patience with the Afghan government and very little sympathy. So we've already seen issues around um, the inauguration process and a whole load of dynamics in that regard, and I think that's something for the Afghan government to kind of really realise. It's really unclear, therefore, what the international and US response would be um, in any intra-Afghan dialogue if the Taliban tries to undermine human rights and democracy. Um, I'm not convinced, and I'll speak openly, that the international commitment is there to actually guarantee um, those hard-won gains. Um, conversations I've had with various different governments, it seems to be very much peace the priority. And I'll talk a little bit just at the end about peace versus justice. I think the Afghan government, I mean, what a number of years. I mean, I was in Afghanistan in 2014 when we had the elections then and the absolute chaos that emerged and the coalition government, which has you know, basically struggled from the outset. Um, I don't think that's any secret to anyone. Um, but obviously, when I've been in Afghanistan, subsequently I've been talking to people, uh, and the concerns are that Afghan interests um, have been bartered away, um, and I think you know that's very much present in, in their considerations. Talking about the elections, I mean, the government was unprepared and fragmented even before the crisis. You know, God knows what it's going to be like now. Um, let's see what happens. But definitely, the rhetoric um, from the Abdullah side in terms of having a parallel government. It's not exactly presenting a unified uh, response in relation to the Taliban. We've got potential flashpoints, such as the inauguration ceremony. I have every sympathy, I have to say, um, for Abdullah, um, having sort of witnessed subsequent elections. Um, but, you know, we all would hope that the Afghan government can kind of try and pull together at this point time. 
regardless, I think that Ghani does go into an inter-Afghan dialogue um, in a relatively weak position. So he's got a slim majority of votes in a contested election which had an extremely low turnout. Um, we've got the divided gov government I've spoken about. The spoilers, you know, there are spoilers on all sides of this, but in particular on the Afghan government side, you know, there are a number of individuals who have really benefited from this status quo um, and have very little incentive to try and divvy up that financial and power pie any more than it's already been divvied up. Um, and you know, one of the points I think that's constantly made to me is that they also have less incentive in terms of seeing a reduction of violence because the violence that affects the Afghan people on a daily basis has actually very little impact on their ability, you know, on their lives um, and their own security. Taliban has obviously uh, consistently refused to talk to the Afghan government, so you know, in light of are the Taliban going to live up to their commitments, not a positive sign that uh, the Taliban's already denounced the Ghani as winning the elections and said that they're going to refuse to negotiate with the Afghan government. Slightly uh, confuses the process when we think there's meant to be the seven day reduction of violence, followed by the nine day reduction of violence where talks would then take place in Oslo. Um, they're going to have to shift that position quite quickly. Um, will violence reduction even hold? You know, and what does that really mean? So, as I said, I felt that a number of those four components of the reconciliation process were being hollowed out. The fact that um, it became not a ceasefire, but a reduction in violence, um, you know, could be seen as, as a kind of uh, stepping down, I think, of that commitment. It is a Taliban concession, though, and it actually is a way around um, the Taliban's rejection of the ceasefire. Um, it could also mean that the government um, is encouraged to join the talks, uh, whereas previously it had been saying it wouldn't join unless the Taliban had held a ceasefire for a month. Trump said it's going to be meaningful, lasting and measurable, but we all know what the Afghan context is like. It's really tricky to monitor. We've got a geographically diverse, um, fragmented nature of conflict. We've already had reports over the weekend of fighting, I think, in Balkh and Mazar and you know, we're going to have to see what the sort of threshold is, I think, for um, both in terms of whether it's succeeded or whether, in fact, it's failed. Um, does the Taliban have sufficient command uh, to actually maintain that violence reduction? You know, we've got the uh, historic Eid ceasefire. Um, I think, you know, that was actually very historic. And I think speaking to friends of mine on the ground, um, it was a time when people actually felt there is an opportunity um, for peace, and maybe the Taliban has more centralized control than those of us have been commenting previously um, felt that they had. But this is a very different thing. You know, this isn't saying have a temporary ceasefire. This is saying we're entering into a peace process. Um, and again, the Taliban itself has its own spoilers in terms of its ideological um, and pragmatic, pragmatic uh, financial incentives to continue conflict. I'm a bit concerned that they're probably going to go into negotiations in Doha, feeling that they've got a bit of an upper hand. They've had experience now of negotiation, they've had 10 rounds. Um, they could push for a strong, hardline government. Um, you know, when we looked at this when I was a reconciliation advisor, we used to talk about the fact that we felt that they would still push for some sort of uh, supreme religious body. There might be some um, kind of backtracking on women's rights some issues over democracy. I don't think we've seen much different. And I mean, the Taliban themselves have been uh, very poor, I think, showing their hand in that regard. So it's definitely one to watch out for. We know that they're going to have to justify a peace deal to their followers too, and also you know, individuals in the military commission that need to be brought into this process. We have the threat of ISKP, which I'm not going to go into, but um, something that they are obviously aware of. Um, and then the final kind of thing that I'd like to just talk about is the Afghan people. Um, because we all know that peace requires compromise. And you know, research I've done suggests that the Afghan people are willing to compromise in the interests of peace and an end to the daily violence that they see. But you know, I wish to kind of go back to 2001 and the bond process, which set us or set Afghanistan um, you know, undermined, I think, the, the peace that Afghanistan could have developed from the outset. The issue of having peace before justice, which was entrenched at Bonn, looks like it's being repeated. Um, 
And the key things I think to be looking at will be proper systems in place in terms of DDR. Um, you know, APRP had a sort of template for that, but I can talk about it later, but wasn't massively successful. Um, but also issues over human rights, women's rights, and justice. Um, and I think, you know, I'd just like to say that we should probably pause there um, and consider um, how a peace process now might potentially pave the way for future conflicts in the future. Thank you, Emily. Thank you uh, for that very detailed and extensive uh, analysis. Um, just before we continue with the next panelist, um, I just wanted to let, let you know that, that unfortunately, ambassador, the uh, Afghanistan's ambassador to the UK, uh, Mr. Say Jawad, was unable um, to join us this evening due to prior commitments. But we do have the deputy ambassador, Mr. Hanif Ahmad Zai, um, who is here and is happy to convey the ambassador's position on the topic um, and to answer any questions directly. Um, we are also pleased to have representations from the Foreign and Commonwealth uh, Office, um, from the South Asia and Af Afghanistan Directorate. Um, the Director and PM Special Representative Gareth Bailey was again unable to join us due to the fact that he's traveling uh, currently in the region. Um, but we do have uh, his colleague here who um, is, is here to observe, um, take your concerns on board uh, and, and take them back to their office. Um, yeah, and uh, we want to continue with the Baroness uh, Saida Wafi now. Thank you. Uh, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the Parliament, those of you who are here for the first time. Um, next time there is a big event, or I want the numbers for the lottery, I'm going to ring up Shonam because I think the way in which she's organised this event in terms of its timing could not be more perfect. You know, the moon, the stars and the sun have all aligned and you couldn't have picked a better moment to be having this conversation. So she's clearly got a knack for predicting timings. Uh, in terms of my own involvement in uh, Afghanistan, my first speech actually when I was first appointed uh, to the House of Lords was on the issue of Afghanistan, particularly on the issue of women in Afghanistan. Um, and of course in government, I had the privilege of uh, being the Minister for Afghanistan for uh, two and a half years. Uh, and over uh, my time in government, we were predominantly um, involved in the drawdown of our troops uh, from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we had some very interesting conversations and I remember at one of those meetings saying that I never thought I would find myself in a place where when we were about to go into Afghanistan, I, I was saying, well, let's just hold on a minute. Have we thought about what it is we're going to try and achieve and how successful we're going to be at it? There have been many previous interventions in Afghanistan and they didn't um, end well. But yet I found, but I had my colleagues uh, wanting to, to very good home about why we needed to be in Afghanistan. And yet when I was in government, I found my colleagues uh, very good home about getting out of Afghanistan. And I found myself, again, on the other side of that argument, saying, well, hold on a minute. We're about to leave Afghanistan. I mean, do we know what we're leaving and what is it that we've achieved? Um, and I remember having a, a conversation with my cabinet colleagues and saying, I, I just don't understand how you wanted to go into Afghanistan when I didn't, and you want to come out when I think we shouldn't. And each time, I think the concern for me was that you can sell a policy, a foreign policy, which sounds good to your own electorate, but is it a foreign policy that's good for the country that you're actually intervening in? And I think today really is all about um, that intervention, uh, the outcome of it, and how we're still trying to deal with what, what it is we thought we were achieving, what we actually achieved, and what we leave behind. Um, and I think there are a couple of issues for us. Um, I mean, first of all, the, the discussions with the Taliban is not a new thing. Um, there's been a Doha office going right back to the time before we, the coalition government was even formed. Um, whether there were closed conversations, open conversations, those conversations have always been happening. Uh, the Doha office has opened and closed and opened and closed on numerous occasions. Conversations with the Taliban have started and stopped and started and stopped on numerous occasions. Um, and I think the only thing that is probably different this time is that we're probably being a little bit more open about what we're doing, but I'm not sure that we're doing anything that differently. In the end, I mean, it's a famous saying which many of you will have heard, that in the end, whatever conflicts there are, whoever 
groups and individuals we feel are beyond the pale and therefore we can't speak to, in the end it always ends with negotiations and tea at the rates. And I think we've kind of hit that point now, you know, where tea at the rates, we're going to have to sit around the table with lots of people we fundamentally don't agree with and we need to find a way through. And I think there were many of us for many years who said this is the way, this is the only way that it's going to, to end. What fascinates me really is a number of different points, and I hope that when we start a much broader conversation, we can bring up on this. I don't want to repeat much of what Emily and Shubnam have already said. I mean, they've adequately covered the, the situation and some of the challenges. Uh, but Mullah Baraga, uh, who is obviously the co founder of the Taliban uh, with Mullah Omar, and now the chief negotiator. Uh, this is fascinating as to how far we have come in terms of who we think is going to be the solution to this matter, who in the end we thought was the very reason why we felt we needed to go in. Uh, I, I'm slightly more cynical than Emily on this issue. I, I, I think that although it wasn't a big part of his election campaign, uh, it was part of uh, Trump's campaign to bring the troops on. So this is a Trump election promise, which he is uh, delivering. Uh, he thinks it is more important to deliver it the nearer we get to a US election. And I think we need to be acutely aware of the fact that there is a US election coming and how that is playing on what is happening in Afghanistan. Um, preconditions is another thing that's been talked about. Um, so the preconditions are that we talk about no preconditions. That's the kind of only sense that I get uh, from what uh, this uh, peace agreement is about. It's also unclear to me what that withdrawal means, uh, just uh, what the time frame for what, the, what, what that withdrawal would look like. So of course the demand has always been foreign troops off our soil, Afghanistan, Taliban's demand, but actually that's a demand which over time has to some extent been ignored with the surge, then met by the drawdown, then met with further drawdown, but actually the US is still there, foreign Trumps are still there, we are some, still there in some form. Uh, so therefore, what does this withdrawal look like? And what will success therefore look like? And will withdrawal be the main aim? But will withdrawal be only uh, within the framework of what will work for the Taliban? Uh, because of course, there are some assets which the Taliban will require to remain in Afghanistan to ensure the short-term security that will be needed if the Taliban feel they're going to be an active part of whatever government is then formed. The op-ed in the New York Times by Sirajuddin Haddani I think was really quite interesting for me. I won the fact that that op-ed ran and that it ran in the New York Times. I never kind of thought during my lifetime I would be reading this. Um, but the caveats in that op-ed, and I read it a number of times were interesting, uh, but also quite troubling. As somebody who was he quite heavily involved in some of those early discussions about what a Shura Council would look like, whether women would be part of it, whether women would be allowed to speak at it, what role they would have in reality in actually playing a role, I think some of the caveats in that op-ed um, probably tell a story of what the Taliban think they are negotiating. And that, for me, is deeply troubling. It takes me right back to the first speech that I did, which is, we can't go in intervening in a country saying we're going to make life better for women and minorities and all the rest of it, and then be quite prepared, I think, as often we have been in these negotiations, to let those issues sit on the back burner to allow us to really bring our troops home. Um, and then the issue of the Afghanistan government, once we know who the government is, uh, they're effectively going to have to implement a deal which broadly they've not been part of negotiating. They're still going to push for an electoral system. Uh, they're going to push for elections, elections which I think nobody would predict that the Taliban will ever win on a clear, uh, an open vote. Um, and therefore, will the Taliban support an electoral system in which they know they will never hold outright power and will probably never really hold uh, the largest uh, grouping uh, within a parliament? Will there really be any genuine concessions? Um, and the cynic in me, I think, says that the fact that we are already seeing um, an Afghan election, which is questionable in terms of its 
results, internal strife as to who won that and who will form government. Um, but I think from the outside, from the US perspective, what I also see is an Afghan election being undermined possibly to support a US election. <coughs> they have said it. That's the cynic in me. That's what I think this peace deal may be about. And that, I think, would be deeply troubling because I think we're raising expectations and we're raising the profile of the Taliban and the kudos that we're giving them uh, by effectively making them this equal partner where almost the kind of moral authority is very clearly set, being given to them in terms of you know, the, the way in which this is being done. Um, where does that therefore leave Afghanistan if at the end of this um, and a US election happens and if Trump gets the result that he wants and then we'll inevitably get bored and move on, where does that leave the natural progression of Afghanistan to govern itself as a healthy democracy? Um, so I'm sorry I'm not as optimistic as you probably would like me to be, but I think having watched this and worked in this space for as long as that I, I have, um, I often feel that uh, the outside influence in Afghanistan, not just in relation to the current Afghan intervention, you know, if we go back a couple of hundred years, the outside intervention in the end is never the one that secures lasting peace. And in the end, lasting peace will be found the Afghan way, where the Afghan people of very different backgrounds find a way to reconcile their differences. And anything that is sense is imposed from the other side, I think will always have, um, I believe, sadly, the possibility of being another state as it should be. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Baroness Wallace. You have worked directly with the government in Afghanistan uh, when she was the Minister of State. Her, her input is definitely very valuable um, and, and, very, and, and contributes to, to the wider discussion of where this war will, will lead. Um, uh, we'll have Bar uh, Christina Lam uh, take us forward. So if you're going to make me a Baroness. <laughs> yeah, so it should be. <laughs> I'd like to second Baroness Wallace actually congratulating you on your timing. Um, not only that, but you seem to arrange a rainbow outside as well this weekend. <laughs> um, so the last time I was in Afghanistan was in September for the elections. I've actually covered every election in Afghanistan since 2001. And the one thing I'd say about this election was it was the first one I wasn't allowed to vote in. So maybe that means it was um, slightly more fair than previous ones. Um, anyway, while I was in Afghanistan, I spent a lot of time talking to young people about peace and what they would do if there was peace. And I found that profoundly depressing because most of the young people I spoke to just looked at me baffled when I said, what would you do if there was peace? They just couldn't even imagine a time of peace. A few people said they would go for picnics, um, but most people just didn't have an answer. And you know, this is a country that's been at war for 40 years, actually, and 70% of the population under 30, so most people have only ever lived through war. And I think actually that has profound effect on people and how they behave, which we could maybe come to later. Um, in my own case, I first uh, started coming to Afghanistan in the late 80s when the uh, Soviet occupation was underway and I used to travel in and out of Afghanistan with the Mujahideen fighting the Russians um, and so I was there when the withdrawal happened, which uh, the anniversary of was just last week. Um, in fact, I'm old enough to remember when we and the Khanis were on the same side um, and a son of love. So when, when I left uh, Bashar after the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, I actually, I never imagined I would be back covering Afghanistan again, and I certainly never imagined I'd be covering my own country fighting in Afghanistan. Uh, but then 9 11 happened. So basically, the, the whole way through my career as a journalist, I've gone back and forth, and the war in Afghanistan has been a sort of constant. So it makes it quite hard, I think, to 
really imagine that peace will come and whether we can really dare to dream that this is going to work. I think it's fair to say that almost all Afghans are desperate for peace. Um, we may, many people in this country may think the war is <coughs> over in Afghanistan, but as I'm sure most of you know more, Afghans have been killed each year of the last few years than any time in the previous year. In fact, last year it was 3,403 civilians, of which 49% were killed by the Taliban, and almost as many by government forces. And in fact, if you go to the amazing emergency hospital for war victims in Kabul and talk to people, you find people who have been um, injured by the Taliban, who have been injured in US airstrikes, and who have been injured by government forces and in the tribal fighting. Um, as my fellow panelists have already said, there are some very big questions about this peace deal, I think. Um, can the Taliban really be trusted, I would say is the absolute number one question. Um, clearly, they've got little to lose from taking part in this process. As Baroness Wazi said, they get kudos, they get legitimacy. Why wouldn't they sit down with the Americans? Indeed, the Americans that I've met who've been negotiating say they're very impressed by how good negotiators the Taliban are. Um, now, in August last year, just before we thought there was going to be a peace deal, before Taliban's, before Trump's famous tweet, I went to Doha and interviewed Sheikh Mohammed Stanikzai, the um, main negotiator. And I have to say that many of the things he said to me were quite worrying about what they thought <coughs> were, um, were going to happen. He, for a start, they don't accept that Al Qaeda was behind 9 11. They argue that the Americans created ISIS. Um, they clearly don't think that women should work. Uh, he even told me off for not covering my head. Um, and so it was difficult to believe that they really um, are committed to an Afghanistan as we have come to know it. Um, in fact, if you follow the things they've been saying on social media, they've been presenting this deal as a victory. I mean, they're, they're saying, Kabul, here we come, basically. Um, up to now, as has been said, the discussions have been between them and the US, and in some ways, both want the same. Both Trump and the Taliban want US troops to leave, so it's not so difficult to agree. At the next stage, the intra-Afghan negotiations, is a whole different kettle of fish. And, I mean, I'm not even sure that either side can agree on what kind of delegation the <coughs> Afghan government side will have. Um, again, going back to what Sanek side said to me, he said that not, they don't accept the Ghani government, they see that as a puppet government. Um, he said that at absolute most they would accept maybe two or three representatives from that government in the negotiations. And I said, well, who would you accept then? And he said, we want people who have actual support on the ground. So I said, who are those people? And he named people like Wilberdin Hekmatia and Dostum, um, basically sort of warlords. Um, so I don't quite know how this is going to work. And the fact that Ghani goes into this with such a weak hand, I mean, yes, he supposedly got 50.6% in these elections, but only, um, <laughs> was, was only about 700,000 votes, I think, out of a population of 30 million people, so that's hardly a strong mandate, and when you have at the same time Dr. Abdullah contesting this and, and already starting to announce a parallel government, um, and appointing his own governments, I don't see how this is all going to work. Um, clearly, most ordinary Afghans feel cut out of this deal, that it's been done with nothing to do with them, and particularly women feel that. And you know, this big question is will there be women in the, the delegation? I'm presuming the plan is to form some, some kind of joint interim government. What form of government would that take? 
Um, another question I have when we're talking about spoilers is what about the neighbors, Iran, Pakistan, which have had played such a role in what's happened in Afghanistan. Are we really to believe that ISI, having invested so much into the Taliban um, and the Haqqani network, is really going to just say, fine, you know, um, have peace and, um, and just share power and not want to have more of a role than that? I'm a little bit dubious about that. Um, Clearly, Trump's main motivation is the election that's coming up. Um, I, I don't know, I look at recent peace deals in other countries that have been more successful, like Colombia and Northern Ireland, and in those cases, the anti-government forces had a lot less um, power on the ground than the Taliban have today. Um, you know, the Taliban claim that they control about 75% of the country. Now, obviously, that is not what other people say, but in the CIA or they think they control about half the country. So it's not like they're kind of been forced to the table because they are in such a weak position. I really do think they just see they've got nothing to lose and everything to gain from this meeting. I am extremely worried, personally, about hard fought for women's rights. Um, some of you may have met the amazing Afghan Women's Orchestra when they came over here and played at the British Museum, British, yeah, British yes, Museum and other places. Um, I mean, anyone who has that opportunity and saw the sort of beaming smiles of those women and listens to their stories of how their lives have been transformed. You know, we can't let that be lost. And when you, of course, the women themselves say we're not going to let this be lost, um, but it, quite how that's going to be protected. The Americans say that they will leave a certain number of troops for counter-terrorism. Also have questions about, you know, who's going to pay for everything in the future? Um, Afghanistan um, has no money. It's military. 90% of the funding comes from the US. Are they really going to keep paying for this? What happens to Taliban um, forces? Are they really going to agree to demobilize? I didn't think so. So um, I hope that this works because I would really dearly love to be able to take my family to Afghanistan on holiday and, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful country. And so any of you that have seen that wonderful advert on Solo TV that they did, Give, give Peace a Chance, I, you know, I really hope that people do give peace a chance, but I just think there are those questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists uh, for their um, sort of brief presentations on the situation presently. Um, I am still optimistic that Tom will join us, <laughs> but um, there is a, he, he has informed me that there will be voting in the House, um, so I hope that that's, uh, that's um, completed very soon. Um, should we start with some questions and then if Tom does join us we'll, we'll, we'll get back to him. Um, so if you could introduce yourself. Yes, oh, you, did, you, did, you, did you want to speak directly or should we wait for the questions? Okay, Okay. sure, go on. Well, thank you very much Norman, for organizing such a fine moment and more importantly for the very fine panelists that we have uh, been working with Afghanistan and with the government for so many years. And uh, we, are, uh, we are very grateful for, for the words you expressed and for the analysis you made uh, fully in line with that. But just uh, very brief reflections on the current status of, uh, of play for the Peace process and the question of the event that you put can you start on peace talks and war in Afghanistan? I'm pretty sure, like the panelists expressed, and to many Afghans in this room, so many Fs are still in our minds. Even uh, we pretend that in the text of this uh, uh, peace deal uh, between the Taliban and the US, there are a number of Fs in, in, in each of the, of, of the articles because we don't know exactly what will happen and how the Taliban will emerge uh, after this uh, process of signing this deal and then into the next phase, which is very important, which is an intra Afghan dialogue process. So these apps are all, you know, uh, that depends on, on how they react and how they are committed 
to um, to go ahead with meaningful um, intra-Afghan dialogue process. In the past, we have been very generous to them uh, by offering no condition for the start of the talks. Even President Ghani, you remember all that, have also offered the venue within Afghanistan to Taliban that we are not knocking doors and in the international community for things. We have been first <coughs> announced ceasefire. We have also been first this week to agree with the reduction of violence that is successfully so far implemented. Why the Taliban has reacted so badly and also negatively so that we we have lost the war in Afghanistan because there was lack of commitment from their side. And I think it's equally important uh, for the international community, including the UK, that we are looking at one office here, that they back the Afghan government and also the Afghan intra dialogue process. The UK has been very instrumental in this respect. We are looking forward to take expertise from the UK, given the fact that they have huge expertise from Northern Ireland, from South Sudan, from Colombia. At the same time, the foreign offices and the Fed is working to uh, uh, allocate some budget for institutions in Afghanistan that is working on peace process. But um, lastly, we are optimistic because um, Afghans are tired of war. This is a very difficult moment in Afghanistan because we have just concluded elections and at the same time this, <coughs> this process starts. We are optimistic because everyone has come to a conclusion that the situation has to change. But at the same time, I, I must say again and uh, express the Afghan government's uh, commitment again that there will be no preconditions on, this, uh, on the peace talks again, but there will be a red line from our end to the Taliban that we will not compromise the achievements of the past 18 years now. So we will not compromise the constitution, we will not compromise the economy's right, minority rights, and, 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 and lastly, also to uh, reiterate that it is a time for international community from the US, from the, the European Union, from other friends in Afghanistan, and countries of the region to join hands and support the Afghan process. It's not for them to decide for our future, but it's for them to support the inclusive Afghan dialogue process. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we'll move on to um, the questions and answers segment of today. Can you please introduce yourselves um, and just mention who your question is directed at? Um, and please do be concise because I know that this could, uh, there, there, there must be quite a lot of questions. Yeah. So. Uh, unlike uh, Christine, I think, I'm very optimistic about the end of the world in Afghanistan. The peace talk between the Taliban and the US remind me of the peace talk between Mujahideen and Russia. And then they remember what's happened. <coughs> the communist regime was removed, and the USSR entirely was. Finished, collapsed. I feel very sorry for the British taxpayer who has spent, which, which spent billions of pounds to rebuild Afghanistan and improve the rule of law, building the Afghan government institution for the past 19 years. But we have to remember. Afghanistan is a very sensitive geographical position. It's an unpredictable country. The country has been left uneducated for the past two centuries. I must say, worry about the president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ali. He might cause a very serious problem to the West as did Amiridus Muhammad Khan during the 19th century. Amiridus Muhammad Khan was one of the king who received the support from Russia and caused a big problem to Britain. I think Ashraf Ali is doing the same thing, looking at the 
announcement of the parallel government by Dr. Abdullah Abdullah is a very dangerous situation. One thing is about diplomacy language. We can talk about things about perfectly, everything is fine, or oh, hopefully things will be improved, and then we hopefully the US will withdraw, the US will do this because of the election in the US, but one thing is about reality. Chinese are very concerned. The Russian, they don't tolerate to see the US military bases in the longer term. And the most important thing, the Taliban are not represented the entire population of Afghanistan. This is a very big question. When you speak with the Uzbek, they say we don't have a Taliban. When you speak with the Hazara, they say we don't have any Taliban. When you speak with indigenous people of Tajik, who are very, very peaceful nation, they say we don't have any Taliban. So the question is, what kind of peace talk happening between the US and the Taliban, the group which doesn't represent the entire population of Afghanistan? <coughs> See, this, yeah. is, this okay. is the question. Yeah. Okay. What kind of peace talk is going on between the US and the Taliban if the Taliban are not represented the entire indigenous people of the country? Okay, so Clarence uh, wants will be leaving us because she's got a meeting uh, after this. So thank you so much. Yeah. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a fair point, but I mean, it, the fact is, in the, one of the problems, as Emily said in 2001, was that the Taliban were cut out of discussion. So. You know, we, I, whether we like it or not, they do represent a certain uh, percentage of Afghanistan. I don't, can't put a figure on that, but they do represent people, they do represent a point of view. And they are the people on the ground fighting. So, you know, the peace talks do have to be with them. The question is, you know, what share of power does that mean they should have afterwards? I have no idea how you know that. Who, I mean, the best way to test that would be an election, but they clearly that's not how they're seeing things, and I, I don't think that is what's going to happen. I mean, we've just had an election there, it cost a lot of money, it took almost six months for some reason to count um, just over 1.5 million votes. So, and the previous election, I don't think we ever got the results of. So, you know, elections have not had a good record in Afghanistan anyway. Thank you. Um, and both India and Pakistan have a um, strategic goal uh, in Afghanistan. Um, what, how does Emily see that playing out? And my second question is, where does Iran fit into all of this? I mean, I think you're, you're, you're right, the regional players, there's a lot of regional interests, um, you know, including uh, China that, that has already been mentioned. Um, you know, I think India, India's role has been a little bit more circumspect. Um, I think their strategic goal has been um, not to end up in a situation where they further escalate tensions with Pakistan, which are already um, at a high level in Afghanistan, because their priority is obviously their border um, with, with Pakistan. Um, and interestingly, when, even when I've been you know, talking uh, in Pakistan um, with Pakistani government officials, you know, off record they'll say, you know, it's not fair. Um, the Afghans look to India and they associate them with Bollywood and universities. And they look to Pakistan and they associate us with, with the Taliban and, you know, safe havens. Um, so in a sense, India's strategic goal has kind of been one. It's seen very much um, as an ally um, for the Afghan government. And obviously very strong relationships between various members of the Afghan government, you know, historic relationships with, with India as well. Um, I think potentially one would hope, and you know, Rusi wrote a paper a few years ago called uh, China and India's Relationship in Afghanistan, and one of the uh, suggestions was that 
if um, the US was going to decrease their role, um, as was sort of being suggested around 2015, that you would see a greater engagement from China and India, um, but neither look willing to really take over. And it goes back to Christina's point about that 90% of um, the Afghan budget and military side, and in fact, more generally, um, being funded by the international um, and particularly the US contributions. So in an instance where China and India are not going to fill that gap, then we're still back in, in the US court. Um, Pakistan, I mean, you know, one can only hope, of course, in this whole entire process, there have been sideline efforts that we don't know masses about, which have been, you know, to basically get us into the situation that we're in, where they're even saying they'll do a reduction in violence, and they've been talking in Doha, and, you know, we've seen, if you look back to when the Doha office was opened and subsequently quickly closed, um, and then the arrest that happened, it was actually Stanek Zai's cousin, I think, and a number of others um, that Pakistan picked up um, and arrested subsequently because they were suddenly worried back in 2000, when was the office, 2011, 12? Um, you know, they were worried that things were getting out of control in Doha and that they didn't have the leverage. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that Pakistan will be watching this really closely. You know, they, the goal for them in Afghanistan is to have a strategic depth. Um, but at the moment, if the Taliban feels that, you know, this is all kind of going in their favor, maybe they feel that the strategic depth is, you know, on the table. Great, thank you. Oh, sorry, Iran. Uh, yeah, I mean, Iran's obviously kind of engaged a lot more in the you know, last few years, and we've seen the Mashhad office and um, clearly relations um, that they've established uh, with the Taliban, you know, they've kind of, I don't know, this sort of a hedging bet strategy, they've got the relations, strong relations with the Afghan government, they've obviously got a big diaspora population there anyway, um, but they've also established um, links with, with the Taliban themselves. I think Iran's got quite a lot going on domestically right now, um, so in a way that's, that, and you know, and they're oriented at the moment um, towards the Middle East. So maybe they don't have quite enough bandwidth um, to get too excited at this stage, um, but obviously potentially could be spoilers and are definitely ones that will be closely monitoring the process, I think, from afar. Because some of the countries of the region wanted the US to, uh, to withdraw from Afghanistan. And we have been engaged from the beginning to them that a peaceful Afghanistan, a stable Afghanistan, is a benefit for all of us. So, in my view, I think there will be more role by Chinese support of role, not like by some of the countries. At, at the same time, it also depends on, on, the Afghan, on, on the Afghan side. If we have managed to change the tone, change the momentum to a more regional uh, economic cooperation between countries of the region, which can be in the benefit of all countries of the region, and they can all engage in more constructive and more supportive role. Thank you. Can I just say something on Iran? Because I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, clearly, Iran has been trying to do in Afghanistan the last couple of years what it's been doing in Syria in terms of trying to <coughs> embarrass NATO and um, um, work with the Taliban. At one point, they were considered an enemy to do that. Um, I can't help wondering whether in the wake of General Soleimani's killing, whether I don't believe personally that if that's just finished, I mean, Iran will do something at some point, and they may look at um, Western targets in Afghanistan as something easier to attack, particularly as um, General Soleimani's replacement is somebody who, who worked quite well in Afghanistan. So I think you know, it's, we don't know what Iran's going to do. Thank you. Um, I do certainly agree that the neighbouring uh, country's influence in the peace process is, is quite important and we need to be able to take that into account. Um, so, next question. I have two questions. I'll try to make it quick. One goes to Emily. Uh, you made a very interesting point about uh, peace before justice. I would like if you can elaborate on that. So, have it in mind that Afghanistan has been in war for 40 years. And in that 40 years, different groups have fought different people and groups. And then the whole population is somehow supporting either 
uh, the Soviet-backed groups or the Mujahideen, you know, the Taliban or whoever. So who's going to do justice on that point? Uh, my second question will go to Mr. Amazai. Um, uh, what do you think about the integration of the Taliban fighters, especially the soldiers on the ground, after the peace process? Uh, uh, having in mind that they have claimed as a uh, this war is a victory, that somehow we defeated the U.S. and Afghanistan, Afghanistan uh, back to U.S. Uh, government, and we will come and we will have the peace process. We will have our own government, and then we share it with each uh, with different people. It's not like if you can, we cannot compare that with the uh, Ekmatyar peace process. The, he comes in and joined, uh, take part in a formed government and then went to an election. So they will come as a winner, as a as conqueror somehow, and then we'll have their own. They say we're going to have our, our government and then we share it with different forces and groups. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, you're completely right. Um, you know, there's, there's no denying that we've had many decades of conflict and, and very different sides and shifting sides and actually all the sides cooperating at various points and then, and then not. Um, the point I think is, is that when we had the bond process, as Christina said, you know, there was an effort to get basically everyone but the Taliban around the table. Um, and so we had warlords who were responsible for atrocities in the 1990s sitting around a table um, divvying up the spoils of the future of the country. Um, that wasn't any form of justice. So we had a complete inability to look back um, at you know the past in order just to be able to move forwards. And I think those of us who kind of followed this um, from, and I, you know, my definition of justice is a, is a broader one than say a retributive criminal justice approach. I think we're talking about restorative justice approach and we're talking about what is needed to actually have um, proper peace and, and true peace and involving some form of compensation and the consultations of the research that we did, which was you know two years, two and a half years, um, really in-depth research at the community level in Khazni, uh, Kabul, and Bamiyan, um, and very clearly people coming out saying yes, we we will compromise and we will have you know we'll accept the Taliban back into power, um, but we want our suffering acknowledged, and I think things like. Afghanistan's National Victims Day, which was rec uh, recognized uh, in 2005 by Karzai. 2006, he was forced to recognize it, and subsequently it's disappeared. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a time of reckoning in terms of, well, if we bring the Taliban back in now, um, what does that mean for the Afghan people who are looking at the government? Um, and what does that mean for the legis legitimacy of the government? Um, and, you know, that goes down to as well this kind of what, what what it would mean in terms of Taliban positions of power. So I think that's where I, you know, I'm not saying let's go and kind of have some kind of international criminal tribunal, though obviously um, the ICC has been interested in Afghanistan uh, for a number of years, but has yet to do anything concrete. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Very important question. I'm glad you raised this. Uh, we are talking, uh, we're not talking about the political leadership. Like, if you think of a few hundred uh, Leadership of Taliban came into the system, but on hundreds, thousands of, perhaps thousands of thousands of uh, foot soldiers. Yes, there is a potential risk that demobilization and reintegration is a very challenging uh, um, approach towards this process because they might join the ISIS, they might um, be uh, with drug dealers, uh, be in not for profit business, etc. Uh, but I think the approach. From, from the Afghan government side that we are now starting to consider this is that there are two things very important here. The first one is education because most of these foot soldiers are in your age, in my age, even younger, and they don't have access to education. So re-education, but proper education. Not those type of educations leveled under madrasas and slums, which produce extremism and also produce uh, anti-democratic uh, divisions. Uh, at the same time, it's also important that how we manage to get uh, these food soldiers into the system, like creating jobs, etc. But um, um, I, I agree with you that um, there are potential risks associated with this to include these food soldiers into the system. And uh, when President Ghani was talking 
few uh, months back about the duration of this negotiation process with the Taliban. I think he, he had in his mind these kind of things that, you know, that it needs a lot of efforts, a lot of planning, a lot of resources that we are willing that the international community will provide. But do you think they should be incorporated into the Afghan security forces? Yeah, yeah, to some extent, why not? If we have proper uh, system of integration, <coughs> if we have proper system of education, because part of the problem with the food soldiers are that they are lacking the uh, basic education. Some of them, they, they have been trained in Pakistan, in Madrasas, they, they have been produced as well as the uh, local level. But I think the uh, right approach, I'm glad that the Minister of Education was here uh, in London and he had a series of meetings with the Prashidam mm -hmm. India. And one of the things that he had asked was support for Madrasas. Because the government is now planning to work on a strategy to integrate these Madrasas into the modern, in, into government and we provide a modern education system. Um, uh, especially in the rural areas, in, in, in those areas where the hundreds of people are food soldiers are. Thank you. My name is uh, Masood Fata, and uh, I would like to ask one question from all panel members, which has got two points actually. So uh, the first question is, I, I'm not going to ask about the longer run consequences of peace talks or peace deals. <coughs> how it is going to impact, because there are a number of dark shaded areas. I heard the panel members saying that they're also worried about this. I will not touch on that. But I would like to ask a brief question on the peace process itself. It's a process that has been going on for, for the past one year. And uh, very soon, we would witness and we would see possibly uh, you know, uh, an agreement reached and it will be finalized. Now, the question is, throughout the process, uh, Afghan people and also the government. Everyone has been kept out of the loop. Now, my concern and everyone's concern is there is a question or there is a concern around trans transparency, accountability, and even legitimacy of the process. Now, now, taking Afghan government and houses of parliament out of the discussion in loop, is it a legitimate process? And also, not sharing any information with the public, with the people. Everyone kept in dark, and no one has any information about the process. Is it really a transparent process? And who will be accountable in the longer run of this? Now, that is another question of accountability. So my question from you and from the representative of Afghanistan government is that as a government and as British politicians and as key member of NATO and the strategic partner of US, do you really recognize this process as a transparent, accountable, and legitimate process? That is the first point of my question. And second part is actually linked to the first part. Let's say the deal will be finalized, and very soon we would have something offered to us. Now, the intra-government Afghan talks that will start, that will be exactly based on this one. Now, the question is, what is going to happen if, if they are demanding from us something which is totally not in our national interest? Demanding from us something which is, we, 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 we completely, we are, we are we are and, and, and critique or we are criticizing to that one. Is, is, is that going to be something that we have to go through renegotiations for another year or we have to accept whatever is available on the table? Thank you. Um, just very briefly on the two parts of the question, let me see. On the US part, uh, you have seen that Dr. Khalidzot was traveling back and forth to Kabul uh, in a number of occasions to greet the president about what's happening. I think we, I, can, I can confirm that all of us know that uh, during the process of negotiation with the US, the Afghan government was fully in picture. Uh, there were some uh, difference of opinions. You have heard this uh, as an Afghan, you know this. But I think uh, we were in the same page. This was fully coordinated with us. And uh, the statement that has been made by the State Department just a couple of minutes ago also confirmed that this is an inclusive process that they wanted the Afghan government to be in all of the phases. In terms of the intra Afghan. Uh, Sorry, has any Afghan representative been involved in that process for the past one year? No, no. <laughs> it, was not, it was not about between the Afghans, it was between the US and the Taliban. That's why um, the US side has kept the Afghan government. So public. this means this Afghan government has clearly been bypassed. And is it an imposed process on Afghan government, or no, there is something I there? Can, no, no, I can't. I can't say that it's, it's uh, imposed on us because there are two things here. One, one part is the U.S. and the Taliban 
uh, agreement, and the other one is intra Afghan one, right? So these two interlink with each other. We also understand that this, these two interlink with each other, but we can't really claim that we, uh, we have to be in those meetings and we have to be part of that. I'm coming to the second part of the question about the next part. What will happen is that President Ghani has been taken to uh, form the <coughs> and also broad based delegation. Probably the number would be this time between 7 and 15. Not, not large. Not 200. Exactly, not 200. And at the same time, the process will be very transparent. The process will be inclusive. Because these people who are going to uh, meet the Taliban will have a full backing by the government and also a full representation by the population. That's, that, that's the change. Right? So we, we don't want to uh, take this process forward in a, in a way that is the public is not aware and the Afghans are actually before that we have red lines yet. So one thing that the government approaches that we don't have, want to put any conditions for the start of the negotiation because it's needed to, to have no conditions. But at the same time, we have red lines, of course. We have to maintain into the position of, of the demand of our people. But these two processes are interlinked, but we can't, we can't say that the U.S. side has kept the Afghan government uh, away from the, from the discussion. And this uh, the U.S. and Taliban deal is, is a very, very important step. Um, uh, because you can, uh, after this, as an Afghan, we are very interested, we are very much looking forward to see what the Taliban comes uh, with options at the table. Because previously they were claiming that the U.S. is in Afghanistan, you are the puppet government, now is the time for them to come and put their plans forward. If they have any plans for uh, elections, if they have any plans for the economy, if they have any plans for, uh, for the achievements of the past 18 years to be kept, if they have any approaches, any changes towards their mentality and policy towards women's rights and minority rights, this is the time. So, so we will be looking forward to this process. Great, thank you. Do you want to well, I mean, it's a really important question, Ms. You know, um, and as I said when I spoke earlier, all, all the Afghans do feel cut out of the process. So I'm sorry, but the government hasn't. Yes, we've had briefings. We haven't been part of the process. Um, so, I mean, maybe this is the best we can get at the moment. Um, there isn't another way to do it because the Taliban wouldn't sit down with the Afghan government. So, um, but I, you know, I. I have no idea what happens now. Like I said, the <coughs> Taliban negotiators I spoke to say they will only accept two or three members of the Ghani government to come. Now, I'm not sure if you're 7 to 15 people. Is that only going to be two or three members of the government, or is that, are you expecting to say? So, to be decided later. Well, yeah. the but how, group, who is going to decide that that's representative? That's yeah. based on, uh, on the consultation we will start uh, with all political parties. And Stables. And originally, when the talks started, you know, the Taliban was supposed to accept the Afghan constitution as part of the tools. That seems to have gone by the way. And that's not saying yes. that you impose that the Americans have that. No, no, that, that's not the aim to impose uh, from the start that you have to accept the constitution. It's about discussion that you want to start. So and you know, that's exactly, it, that it also includes constitution because the Afghan constitution is a democratic one. An Islamic one that we did. Constitution is also one of our red lines, but of course we, we want to hear from them how they react and how they behave. Shall we? Oh, go on. Let's just add. I mean, I think you're very right. Um, but I, you know, I don't. I do think that there are times in peace processes that, that they do happen behind closed doors, um, and necessarily so, um, so that you know, there's space. Um, and I hope that some, you know, the intra-Afghan dialogue, if it happens, can also happen behind closed doors. Um, you know, if you look to Northern Ireland, people go, oh, the Good Friday Agreement, you know, that, that wasn't the result of Tony Blair coming in and, you know, within a few months you had a Good Friday Agreement. That was the result of a decade um, of, you know, closed doors, random hotels in the middle of, you know, various parts in, uh, Northern, in Northern Ireland of discussions. And at the same time, we should know that it's also, um, you know, potentially various, uh, I'm not going to say necessarily British government, but, but components um, taking out family members of, of the IRA. So it's a bit of a carrot and stick incentives too. So I do think we need to look at that. Um, but, you know, the clearest thing, and 
the need to bring it to the Afghan people um, and to at some point see it as acceptable is the experience in Colombia when they had a peace deal, which was actually a far more comprehensive one than we've even seen being discussed you know, in any of the um, uh, discussions so far. Um, and when it was put to the people, the people rejected it. Um, so you know, that, that should be on people's minds uh, when we move forward and see where this goes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much for taking time and attending this today. My name is Ahmed. Uh, I'm one of the residents here in the UK. Um, my question, um, I'll have three questions, so each panelist can answer one of them. The first question is um, this historic peace deal between the US and the Taliban, and today's topic as well, can US and Taliban peace talks end the war in Afghanistan? So my first question will be to um, Christina, as you have quite sufficient experience in the region. So my first question would be, the approach that the US have taken, uh, taking direct, um, talking with the Taliban directly and not really involving the Afghanistan government. I know, as Mr. Ahmed said, there has been a representative who's been briefing the president, but there's no been direct contact between the president and the Taliban. Is that giving Taliban more credibility and bringing him into Kabul as conquerors or as victors and undermining the Afghanistan government and the people of Afghanistan? Is that going to be the end of war or the beginning of a new war? So that's the first question. And my second question would be to um, Emily. Um, you mentioned a couple of times about the bomb process and not involving the Taliban. Could the international community involve people who took blame of 9-11 and killing thousands of innocent people? So were they, would that have been a, a legit process if the Taliban were on the table? And then finally to Mr. Ahmad, again, this would be referring to his question again. Um, you do say that Afghanistan government, government is brief uh, about the process or the peace process. As Christina said earlier, that the head of Taliban peace negotiator does not recognize Afghanistan government as an independent body. They're, the reason they are talking with the US directly because they do not consider Afghanistan government to be the real representative of Afghanistan. They think they are the real representative people of Afghanistan and they should be talking to Taliban directly and taking matters into their own hands and not considering the Afghan government. Are you not worried that that could actually raise more interest to the neighboring countries around Afghanistan, like the Iran, like Russians or like Chinese as well? Can they gain something out of this if Taliban come to Afghanistan as uh, victors of the war that they have been fighting for the past 20 years? And thank you very much. Thank you. And bomb process, yeah. Um, yeah, of course, um, it took place, you know, post invasion <coughs> of the justification of 9 11, which was totally spurious uh, in any case. Um, and. Honestly, I feel that the, the US, in the first few years of engagement in Afghanistan, um, absolutely failed to uh, to do anything constructive, um, missed a massive opportunity at Bonn, um, and was entirely myopically focused um, on this threat from Al-Qaeda, um, and therefore could not engage the right people. Um, but also, I think, just you know other issues such as not having proper DDR mechanisms. Um, so you ended up in a situation where um, people who had armed did not have to disarm. Um, and you set the stage for what we have um, in terms of warlords with their own private militias. Um, so even you know, even if you didn't bring the Taliban in, there were severe failings on the part of, part of everyone who was at the bomb process to uh, implement any of the basics that you would normally see in, in terms of a peace deal. And then there was Iraq. And then there was Iraq, exactly. They had, they had a couple of years to try and do something, and then they just got distracted. Um, we, your question, um, I can't really answer that. I mean, I, I, you're right about um, the Taliban getting kudos and legitimacy from these talks. Um, yeah, that's, as I said, you know, they have everything to gain. Nothing to lose. They can walk away at the end of the day, but they've 
that I've had a year of sitting down with top State Department officials, general, American generals, you know, um, and being kind of treated almost as equals. So um, obviously that looks good for them. Um, and I am concerned that the way their discussion of what's happened on social media is being presented as a, a victory that they've driven out the foreigners and um, to looks like they would just take over. So I, I don't know if this is going to be the start of a, a new war. I really, really hope not. I hope that people are, I mean, the one thing I think we can all agree on is most people are really fed up with fighting and would like to just get on, particularly younger people like you. you know, if people are very connected. That's a big difference between, so when I was in Afghanistan in the late 80s, Afghanistan was kind of cut off from the rest of the world. There was no open lines and they had no idea what was happening outside and now everybody there is all on Facebook and smartphones and everybody knows what kind of opportunities there are in other countries and they're trying to, and lots of young people are you know doing startups and trying to do things that normal countries have and they want that right they don't want to be every time they go out not knowing if they can come back again because suicide bombing, so um, I hope that that feeling of wanting a normal life is strong enough that this works. Your question had two parts, I will the answer. The first one was with regard to the election by the Taliban to the Afghan government. Look, we have been involved with them since 1995. It's quite obvious that this is the first time that formally, there were some, some occasions in the past that we have been in touch with them, uh, and the government and the Taliban. But it's the first time that we formally face-to-face -face talk. It's the beginning of the road, it's not the end. So we don't expect the Taliban to recognize the Afghan constitutions from the beginning. We don't expect them that they recognize the Afghan government because they are winning fight with us. So this will be determined during the negotiation process where we will, Afghans, ordinary Afghans, <coughs> myself, believe that it might take maybe more than a year or maybe two years, maybe a few months. We don't know exactly. The second part is with regard to the influence uh, um, as a result of this uh, influence by some countries of the region. I think it's, it's the reality in countries of the region, I mean in the population, and also to some extent to some of the um, institutions in these countries, is that a peaceful and stable Afghanistan, Afghanistan is in their interest. That's, that's number one. But number two, as I said, in this respect, I think it also belongs to the Afghan side, to the Afghan government, how well we play in terms of our diploma diplomacy in the region. And also, it takes me back to the question of, uh, uh, of the, role, uh, the role of the big powers like UK, US, EU, NATO, UN, how they provide support in a way that countries of the region is fully committed to cut ties with the Taliban and support the intra-Afghan peace process. Because if during the negotiation between the U.S. And, 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 and the Taliban, this worked very well. Because of these pressures by the U.S. side, because of the pressures from Western countries, the Taliban have come to uh, sign a deal with the U.S. Thank you. Can I just say something? One thing, almost the elephant in the room, we haven't discussed is the role of the government by the Afghan government. One of the reasons that the Taliban have been able to come back in People don't feel that this government provides for them. They find that to most people I speak to, the government is a nuisance. The police are constantly harassing them, are demanding bribes, they can't get justice. So, you know, when the Taliban come into areas and then um, sort out the crime and offer speech and justice, people are um, happy to see it. It's not that people of the Taliban, it's just they're so fed up with the Afghan <coughs> government. So I do think there's a, a huge onus on the government side to start getting its act together, to stop being so corrupt, to start delivering to people. Otherwise, you know, the Taliban have some um, justification in saying that they could do a better job than the government is doing. Thank you. I'm just going to take a few women now because I know we've um, taken quite a few minutes. So oh, should we start with you? Yeah, yes. Actually, can I take a few questions at the same time, just so that we can get a, we've only got a few a little while there, so yeah, if you can keep them concise. Uh, 
به نام خداوند نتال خدمت شما سلام تقدیم می کنم که ما فون تازه از افغانستان اومدیم می خوایم که آواز زنای افغانستان به شما به زبان فارسی برتان بگویم که چون برنامه لایو است می دارم که اینا می برنامه را در افغانستان ببینن از او خاطر ما می خوایم که بشن فارسی صحبت بکنن گونا باید بفهمند ما در مورد چی بحث می کنیم بحث ما در مورد پروسی سال هست که می خوایم که ما قبلا در افغانستان وکیل بودم در پارلمان اسم از نوزیاری ما و دو سال است که در یوکی آمدیم و آل فیلا در مورد پروسی سال می خواهیم که بحث بگرم در مورد خانم ها که باید از تقاضای ما از سازمان کنسل فیلا که فیلا نیست پس از این سال فعالیت دارند در یوکی و بسیار زیاد اینا مقام اول گرفتند دست انتخابات ما خواهش میکنیم به خاطر که چون اینا امکار هم هستن با افغانستان خواهش خانم های افغانستانی هست که باید خانم ها را در می پروسیس هم باید, باید اشراق بکنند خانم ها یعنی هیچ امکار نداره که مثلا بیدیم خانم ها این پروسیس هم باید پیش دارن ما اصلا تقاضای با از تمام خانم های افغانستانی هست که مشکل پرابلم از اینا مین است که ما چندین دهه جنگ موسفری کردیم بسیار مشکلات زیاد در افغانستان داشتیم ما بسیار کشته دادیم بسیار شهید دادیم بسیار زیاد ما یتیم داریم ما محیوب داریم ما اون سیستم خانه های ما از بین رفت اولاد ما از بین رفت و تمام زندگی ما از بین رفت آسایش ما از بین رفت ما می خواهیم که پس دوباره بحقت نریم ما می خواهیم پس به شرف بکنیم ما بس می خواهیم که می به سیستم اینترنت داخل شاید به سیستم به شرف داخل شاید می خواهیم که اولاد ما به سیستم دیگه ما مالا اولاد ما سوال ما سوال ما ای است که یعنی خانما در پروسی سال باید جای داشته باشند در قدم اول که ما ما بدانیم که مشکلات خود در این پروسی سال را بگنجانیم ما نمی خواهیم که پس دوباره به اخر ما می خواهیم که پیشت بکنیم اولاد ما پیشت بکنند خود ما پیشت بکنیم افغانستان پیشت بکنند ما دیگه نمی خواهیم که مثلا پس ما به اخر بده چون ما بسیار خستگی ها را تکنیم بسیار یعنی ما بسیار کشته دادیم شهید دادیم بسیار از جنگ های نیومتی در افغانستان که در جیدیان دارد ما نمیدان که پد برقب کنیم میخواییم که پس دوباره ما فیلن که ما امی خانم ها پرد و بسار فیلن تا جایی هم که مثلا ما میتونیم که دست بخوانیم تعدیل کنیم تحصیل بکنیم و میخواییم که این سیستم ما ادامه بکنیم تشکر میکنیم از دوزار So the question was what role do the women of Afghanistan play in this They've gained quite a lot in the last 20 years. Um, the freedoms that uh, the women of Afghanistan have uh, when it comes to work and education and having active participation in society, that should not be lost. And they, um, the, we seem to have lost the, we've spoken to them about many elements of the peace process, but women's rights, I think, is the most important. Um, when, prior to 9-11, um, women were the losers of this war. Uh, drastically, um, and I think the peace process uh, and the reason for these negotiations, um, the, the, the focus of is on ensuring that these gains that women have had, these freedoms, are not lost. So she wants to ask, how is that going? To, how are we going to ensure going forward that women are part of the, the discussions? We all really agree with that. We've been saying that that's one of the points. Uh, um, my fear is that President Trump, in his rush to get the American troops out, it's not really, I don't believe, I'm afraid that he's very concerned about the women. I don't think he's very concerned about women in America, to be honest. So I don't think he's very concerned about women's rights in Afghanistan. So we have to hope that the government, as Randy Obama has been saying, will say this is a red line and that women's rights must be respected. But my interaction with the Taliban negotiators was not very optimistic. I mean, they've been kind of pushing this whole, what we call in the media, Taliban light, where they say, oh yes, we will have allow girls to go to school. But when you kind of drill down, would you actually allow a woman to do this? Would you have, would you have a woman president? Then, then they Okay, so um, we'll come back to questions. We've now got Tom, um, who has been able to join us, thankfully. Um, if it's okay, we'll give you a few minutes to just present us your take on the subject and whether the US uh, Taliban talks 
will actually end the war in Afghanistan, a new experience from, from actually serving in Afghanistan as well, um, and then we'll go back to questions. Is that all right? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Vivashi. I'm sorry, so sorry I was uh, I'm, I'm terribly late um, for various rather obvious reasons. Um, serving in Afghanistan was an enormous privilege, not just because it was an opportunity to serve my country, but because it was an opportunity to serve yours and, uh, and to meet some of the most extraordinary people uh, I had the privilege to know. One of the things that I took away from four years in Afghanistan, one year in Kabul, and, and three in Hilman, was foreign intervention doesn't really help. Foreign opinions don't really help. And foreign presence certainly doesn't really help. A lot of the discussions that are currently being had in different ways by Americans or uh, Qataris or any number of different uh, interest groups uh, are conversations that need to be had uh, within Afghanistan itself and to be had within uh, communities and within uh, groups themselves. Because the presence of foreigners distracts and allows others to be distracted. So when I look at the American talks today in Dhaka, I have to say I, I find them somewhat difficult. Uh, uh, and I find them somewhat difficult because the people who are negotiating are not people who have uh, long-term interests in Afghanistan. One wants to leave. Their interests are therefore very obviously short-term. And the other one sees Afghanistan as an emirate of a greater uh, Islamic khalifa in some ways, Mu'ami in some ways. And so again, doesn't actually see Afghanistan for what it is, which is a, a nation of people, a nation of communities. Um, yes, different in many ways, but also united in others. Uh, and so I don't see the negotiating partners in that, in those talks, as truly representing a future interest. And that I find very concerning, because the concern is not just the legitimacy that these talks give, but the removal of legitimacy from the organizations within Afghanistan that are really trying to come to the compromises that are called government. All governments are compromised, that's the nature of government. And I feel that in some ways they are undermining uh, the government in Kabul. I don't need to be told that there are problems with the government in Kabul, I know that. I don't need to be told that there are challenges between different uh, people like different groups within uh, the Al. We know that. But if those discussions aren't resolved within the Al and within the communities in Afghanistan, if they are exported to five-star hotels in Gaza, then what we're not setting up is a future peace plan. What we are setting up is future instability. And so I'm somewhat concerned by the nature of the talks in themselves, the wrong people around the table. And they are talking, both of them, in a way that is much more appropriate to the 1800s than it is to the 20th, 20th century, 21st century. Thank you. Three questions for anyone who wants to pick them up. In practical terms, prisoner release, 5,000 Taliban prisoners, how dangerous is that for the security, the future stability of Afghanistan? As for the general humanitarian aid effort, how is this in the bigger picture going to affect UN agencies and NGOs working in the country trying to deliver practical aid to Afghans in terms of funding and their security and their ability to work? And finally, what does anyone think about some kind of healing process outside of these practical peace, peace talks, peace agreement, a healing process for the Afghan people who have lost loved ones, who have suffered enormously over the past 18 years or more? How will they reconcile with each other in society? That's three very easy questions. Um, <laughs> healing and resolution is incredibly difficult in any society. Um, 
it's it's pretty hard in peaceful societies. It's really difficult because we know ourselves in places like Northern Ireland, the moment there's any bloodshed at all. And in a country like Afghanistan where everybody is a victim, and tragically, even the current oppressors are also victims. It, it's very hard to find ways through it. Now, I was particularly impressed when uh, Pierre Galani was starting to work on that and his death has been, I think, a great loss to the process. Um, and I know that his daughter has taken up a lot of work on that and his son in different ways. So there are, there are opportunities for those conversations to be had. But the reality is that it's it's talking in time that gets you through it, and it's normalization. And at the moment, normalization is really hard um, for very obvious reasons. Um, I'm delighted to say I've forgotten your other two questions. Uh, prison release and the practical implications for UN agencies, NGOs, theory, humanitarian aid. Um, prison release depends. Uh, I don't know who's being released, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on the specifics. But you know, we all know that many of the Taliban fighters are not Taliban in any way that you know you or I would assume to be sort of you know followers of Osama bin Laden or something like that. But you know, many of them are kids who are paid to fight for a particular purpose, were rounded up, were caught from various different ways. So different releases can be done in different ways. I I can't tell you whether or not that five thousand is. Hardcore or unlucky, it could be either. What about the issue of the impact on humanitarian aid? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, th that's the last part that I wanted to pick up on, on reconciling between the, uh, those who are affected. From I think there were two occasions in uh, in the more in, in the recent years that we have demonstrated. I, I said at the beginning that Afghans are dying for peace. Is that one in Niger and Kabul, mm -hmm. the last one? Uh, there was no politicians sitting in the front chairs like the leaders. And so all the uh, all those who suffered actually the statements with cry and everything, they expressed that they are willing to peace and they want to sacrifice themselves for peace. That's number one. Number two is also a demonstration of the two round of talks that happened in Moscow and also in Kabul in Afghans. Those people sitting in this side of these chairs were those who fought the Taliban for a number of years. Different ideologies difference of opinions. Why they sit together? Because Afghanistan is tired of war. And I also agree with you that when it comes to the normal population, to the general population of Afghanistan, peace completely means different to a, as to a nurse in Malaysia, a woman nurse, that she wants to see herself that in the future she's able to go to the hospital. Peace for an Afghan refugee here, for our, for our diaspora, means that it is a, a peaceful Afghanistan. There is a flight coming from Kabul to London, and he can freely go and visit family, etc. Peace for another minority, the, the Hindu brothers, Afghan Sikh communities, that they can freely practice their religion. So it's it is the beauty and also it's the complexity of the of the issue that is interestingly being put put forward during the negotiation process. But I can tell you that all Afghans, all of uh, Afghans now uh, have come to the conclusion that. Peace is for the benefit of everyone and for the benefit of everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll just pick up because we, we spoke a little bit before you came in about the kind of broader reconciliation and healing process. And I do think it's incredibly important uh, if any um, of our mistakes from the past can be recognised. Um, research I've done, which you have mentioned, but I think one of the clearest things coming out were ordinary people saying some form of apologies in and of itself. Um, could actually be part of the healing. So people talk about when they feel that their hearts would be healed, would actually be hearing um, and seeing people um, admit guilt, or at least, you know, and we saw what happened in the 2014 election when Ghani decided to bring Dostum on board. You know, he was cajoled into um, some form of statement, um, which was, you know, politi a political tactic, but, um, actually was received not as badly or cynically, I think, as, as maybe myself would have uh, received it. 
So I do think that some form of apology, some form of discussion, and not simply just sweeping the past away um, will be necessary in the long run. And on the prison release, completely right that we don't know who's, who are going to be released, um, and many people who join the Taliban do so for very practical um, reasons, um, whether they're financial or due to necessity, etc., etc. Um, but I do you think that we need to remember that prisons are known sites of radicalization with my sort of terrorism hat on, um, and not least the experiences we've had in our own country um, in terms of how the prison environment can work. Um, so I would be concerned, yes, about the impact um, of the release of those 5,000, and you know, I think in a way that's over to the Taliban as well to show that those 5,000 can toe the line if that's exactly what the Taliban is wanting them to do, which I think we've said earlier today, we're not quite sure that that is what the Taliban wants to do. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll take three. On the first, yes. oh, really quickly on the healing process. I'm not very sure about this in the Afghan context because not only is everybody a victim, but an awful lot of people have changed sides back and forth over the years, so it's very complicated. Apologises for what, and I think you could end up stirring up a whole new <laughs> hornet's nest, if you like, um, by trying to do something and make things worse. So I would actually be tempted um, in the Afghan context not to do that, just to try and get on and start delivering to people just basic needs that they are not getting. At so I'll take three questions, then you guys can pick what you'd like to answer. So um, let me, I'm trying to find a few women. <coughs> no women hands open. Uh, uh, there is? Okay, okay. I, I can't see. But we'll start with you then, okay? Yeah, yeah. So my name is Darius. I'm in charge of the Central Asia Society at King's College London. <coughs> I want to start off with Emma's first point about peace versus justice. I think that's a very important topic to focus on because I think one of the biggest challenges that the people of Afghanistan are talking about is peace at any cost. How can we give peace to a group that's committed crimes for such a long time? And what is the legal framework for justice? Just because they're sitting around the table talking about peace, does that mean we should just forget all of the bad things that they've done in Afghanistan? So peace at any cost is, is a very important... Uh, transition of justice. Yeah, peace, is a very, uh, peace versus justice is a very important topic. The second point is also about uh, representation. First of all, I don't think the Taliban does represent the majority of the people of Afghanistan. And even if it does, why should, why should that be a justification for giving them power? Just because they represent the majority, they still have terrorist views and ideologies. And of course everyone wants peace, but it's not just about peace. It's about giving power to an ideology, to a terrorist ideology that will have a huge influence on the people for generations to come. I mean, imagine Afghanistan being under tele Taliban rule for the next 30, 40 years. Look, for the past 40 years, we have had war, but at least it's been war because of conflict. Imagine the, the next 40 years of children growing up in a Taliban-led society. They're going to be growing up in a society where they've been brainwashed. The Taliban can cease, can cease to be a terrorist group, but what guarantee is there that they're going to cease to put aside that they're going to put aside their terrorist radical beliefs. How can we make sure that they're just going to say, I'm not the Taliban anymore? How can, how can we make sure that they're not going to put aside their very, very extreme ideology, which will have an influence not just on the people and the children of Afghanistan for the next 40 years, but also on the, on the neighboring countries? Um, Emily talked about um, ISKP in Central Asia. What message does that send to them? That, look, if you carry on with your extremism, you're going to get power in the end. So it sends a very, very negative message, I think, to the neighboring countries as well. But at the same time, it's also about, it's also about um, the future political system of the country. That's why we're facing so many problems now. People are calling for federalism, people are calling for parliamentary democracy, some radical people are calling for completely changing sides. But then the, the, the root cause of the issue is because um, when you look at the, 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 the breakdown of the Taliban, what kind of views they represent, it's obvious what, what, what kind of views they represent and which parts of the country strongly align with the Taliban. But the question that I have is, suppose the Taliban, uh, peace with the Taliban does happen and peace, the Taliban does share the government. Don't you think that will just eventually lead, lead to a breakup of the country because some people in some parts 
And this is, again, to do with consultations. And Tom's point about, are we really talking with the people? Are we really talking to the people in the north? Are we really talking to the people in the east, in the west, and the south? Or are we just talking to a few people at the top who appear to be the majority, but in fact, they're a very, very small minority who just want to dominate power? So consultation with the people is very important. Um, really, really, we've never had a referendum about this. How can we say we represent the views of the majority? And at the same time, it's really important to focus on the diaspora, and that's why groups like the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan are so important. Because in just two hours, we've had so many questions asked, and if we carry on with this, then imagine we can get, we can, we can find so many more questions. And the diaspora, they're in a good position to do this, because they've lived in Afghanistan before, they live in the UK now, we don't live under the sphere of the Afghan government or the Taliban. We can just discuss things transparently. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, at the back. I was wondering to your panelists how the Afghan government can further legitimize itself both in the international community and to local populations um, and what kind of tangible steps they can take. Uh, I'm a uh, researcher on governance and politics on Afghanistan. Uh, I think there is enough doubt cast on the peace uh, talks. I don't want to add to that, but I just wanted to highlight that war is a very complex problem. Everywhere in the world we, we see uh, war. Uh, it, it requires same complex uh, responses. I don't think we see enough of that. Uh, I mean, as we talk about the, the peace talks in Afghanistan. Uh, I would like to know the perspective of the panel on the uh, uh, governance and politics uh, in Afghanistan. As we see, politics has have failed to mobilize uh, community, mobilize people. So we see more divisive politics emerging in the last uh, two decades. So is, is that, uh, I mean, is now the right time to uh, relook, uh, I mean, how governance system that was uh, configured and born uh, is, is uh, working? I mean, can it move forward? Can it address the current challenges of Afghanistan? I go back to the, the justice question. Um, completely understand about the concerns in relation to reconciliation and bringing people into government that we, we might not like, and you know, a whole host of issues associated with that. Um, Christina's right in terms of you know, there are so many sides to this, and people changing sides that um, it's very, it's not always obvious. Um, you know, everyone's perpetrator might be someone else's victim, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I do think that we will need to be really sensitive to some really rigorous um, DDR process, which looks at who and what and how people are being reintegrated and what that means and the legacies um, of, of the past in relation to that. Um, but also, there are systems in place already which just aren't being used. I mean, there's like a government senior appointments mechanism or whatever, which is technically meant to vet every senior level of appointment, um, which is just never operationalized. So actually, I just think there are so many, there are more checks and balances within the Afghan system, which should be um, operationalized, um, in particular, if we are going to bring in others uh, to the government. And I mean, on the issue of governance generally, Coalition governments uh, have a very bad reputation in Afghanistan, and I don't think the latest one has necessarily done that um, any more, has, has you know, shown any more success in relation to coalition governments. And you know, in, if, you, if the goal was to bring Taliban into the government without an election, um, yeah, that would be a pretty unstable uh, governance system, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, forgive me, I'm, I'm extremely cautious about lecturing other countries as to how to do their own reforms. Um, uh, DDR, I saw trying to be imposed in 2004 5 it was a complete disaster. It was again imposed in 5 6 again. But, <laughs> well, it, was, it, just never, it wasn't actually properly implemented because they hadn't allowed, you know, they, they hadn't implemented the right, All right. processes. In I saw five battalions of American troops and British troops and German troops and Swedish troops with millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to force it onto communities which don't live in Kabul. It was a total disaster. And it wasted huge amounts of time and it caused huge amounts of antipathy. It was a form of colonial uh, control and it was a total failure. Um, the real problem, the only real problem with governments that I see in Afghanistan, forgive me, is that power has started the wrong way around. Uh, we haven't empowered. You know, when we when we started 
the colonial rule of Afghanistan in 2001, which is what effectively the UN mandate was. Uh, we empowered the central authority and did not empower communities. Um, we did not recall shuras, which are fundamentally democratic bodies in villages and communities. We did not uh, re-empower the groups that had been uh, murdered and dismembered by 30 years of violence. We didn't rebuild the structures of legitimate power that Afghanistan had had for the best part of six, seven hundred years. Um, we did. Now, what to do? Well, I'm afraid it's not for me to say. You know, Afghanistan has <coughs> got a government with some legitimacy, certainly in some parts of the country. Uh, the government has made some compromises that personally I'd be uncomfortable with, but you know what, our government makes compromises that many people in this country are uncomfortable with, and every government around the world makes compromises with groups that other people are uncomfortable with. I'm afraid that's just the nature of seeking peace in the local area. We've done deals with the IRA, who tried to kill my family, who tried to kill many other people here, and indeed succeeded in killing many people here. So, you know, all governments make compromises, and it's not for me to tell uh, Afghan leaders how, how and who they should make compromises with. Afghans, I mean, what happens is we, in the Afghan government, whether you can actually come up with a representative group of people to sit down with the Taliban and also protect the, guard, the rights that Afghans have um, won over the past years and make sure that this isn't all lost, um, but we just have to pray. Very briefly on, on the question of, uh, of the media, but just legitimacy to the people and also international community. We have had a very difficult and tough election. Uh, I'm sure that Afghans in the room always are on me and say that yes, it was not easy. Questions about it, there's no doubt. That's prolonged. But now the commitment is that we will have an inclusive government. Finally, we will have an inclusive government. At the same time, from the international community side, I think the statement today by the US also refers to the Constitution. Any arrangements coming up in, in, in the future should be within the Afghan current Constitution. And I think it's equally important from the international community side that they have to support not just politically but also financially of concern because a number of uh, concerns raised by the participants about how we fund all of these issues like inclusion and integration and everything. So uh, that's my point. All right, well, uh, thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to you in a, in a few minutes. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. And um, can you please join us, uh, join me in thanking our amazing panelists thank for you. taking the time. continue speaking about what matters to uh, the, the people of Afghanistan, to women, to youth, to elders, to disabled, to every citizen of Afghanistan. Is that's the only way forward to be able to ensure that it's inclusive, to be able to ensure that the peace process, the uh, government uh, dialogue, uh, and hopefully once the deal, if it is signed, uh, it, it, we are able to reach a negotiation stage, it will involve everyone contributing to what Afghanistan would look like post-US uh, withdrawal uh, of troops. Uh, if you do have any other questions going forward, uh, or if you'd like to uh, suggest any other topics of discussion that you'd like Conservative Friends of Afghanistan to hold, please do get in touch, a website, a web, uh, email, I'm sure most of you do have it. Um, we do have a lineup of hopefully uh, quite a few upcoming events, both on issues in Afghanistan and uh, issues that uh, British, the British and ISIS are facing in the UK, including integration, language, uh, active participation in society. So um, this, this conversation will continue. And um, yes, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you.